All right, a little video introduction. He said, you're banned from introducing yourself. I guess I messed up last time. I tell you what, I hope you're ready. Everybody online, if you're on vacation or you're, you're out of state, so glad you're with us. I believe God has a, an amazing word, a timely word. How many want a timely word from God? You just know that, God, I need a word from you today. Uh, we start the new school year. We start, you know, what's going on in life right now. We're seeing things kind of change. We need a word from God. So I would also ask this, how many of you right now, when you look at the state the spiritual state that our country is in right now, how many of you think that we need an awakening from God to bring some healing? Or you think that, right? Are you okay if I preach on awakening? Yeah. Right? All right, good deal. Because sometimes we can think this. This is what I, as I was writing this message, I began to think, well, man, God, this is the worst shape our country's ever been. Do I really know that? Did I live back in the 1700s? So I started flipping back in the 1700s. You know, in the 1700s and 1800s, the country got in bad spiritual shape, and God sent mighty men and women to do awakening, to waken the church back up. And when the church woke up, the church filled back up, and places of sin shut down. Is that okay with you? So we're praying for awakening. We believe God's stronger and more powerful than anything going on right now in our country. When I say the church, I'm talking about the body of believers. That's the church, right? This is just a building, but I'm talking about the, the capital C church, all the churches across the country, the body of believers that you make up the church, okay? But when there's been an awakening, when there's been a powerful movement of God, we know God has shown up and things have turned around. So I'm just believing in faith. God, you're going to do it again. We sing songs about God doing it again. Do we believe it or we just sing it? I, believe we, I think we sing it and believe it. Look at 2 Chronicles. Here's, here's a game plan for how to get things turned around. Here we go. Verse, chapter 7, verse 14, if my people who are called by name, name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, when, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Aren't you glad God says that's a promise? That's a promise. So the winning war plan, I believe I'm, I'm attributing today's message, it gets back to the battle that we're all in. Here's the winning war plan that God gives the church. Number one, he says, humble yourselves, Right? Seek the Lord. We know pray also. we got to turn from our, our ways, right? And then uh, God's going to heal. Super simple. Sometimes we can feel overwhelmed. God says it's pretty simple. Here's what you got to do. That's the Christian game plan to get back and win the war we're in. I believe we're in desperate need right now for an awakening. I can easily list off some things, some good things our government's doing, some bad things our government's doing right now, right? But you know that government is not the solution. Jesus is solution. We got to remember that. The government was never designed to save America. Jesus was sent to save America. Other places too, but right now I live in America, so I'm going to talk about America if that's okay. Right? But in America, we need a revival. You hear the revival, that means we need an awakening up of the churches, of the people. Can you imagine if we keep going the direction we're going? Picture, some of you are young, I'm 50, some of you are like 30. Picture your grandkids, what's this country going to be like for your grandkids? If we keep going the direction we're going. At some point, the church has to rise up and start being, start being the church again. So this is a call out to us. I believe as Christians, we owe it to our grandkids to take a stand for what God says take a stand for right now. You know, there's over 200 million non-church people in America. That makes us the fourth largest unchurched country in the world. Think about this. We used to be the number one church country in the world. We used to be the number one. Well, what's happened? What's happened? I think the further we drift away from the word of God in our lives, right, we start listening to the worldview, what the world says is appropriate and right. When we get away from the word of God, we get messed up. I think it's easy to see we've got some messed up things in our country, but aren't you glad God is bigger than mess ups, right? He's not caught off guard. He's not shocked. He's just waiting for his people to wake up. Here's what I believe. I believe God still loves America. He loves the church, right? And if the church will be the church, we're guaranteed to win. He says he'll heal our land when we do it his way. That means we're guaranteed to win. I'd also say, and would you agree there's a lot of anti-Christian sentiment going around, right? Trying to, trying to make us feel guilty or shame because we believe in what the word says. I think Christians that are not biblically based are getting their clocks cleaned by the devil right now. If you're not biblically founded on the word of God, you're getting your clock clean. And then you're wondering, God, this thing doesn't work well. When you get down to it, we've gotten away from the word of God in our lives like we're supposed to. Today's message is titled Awakening to War. The awakening has to happen in the church before it happens in society. 
Sometimes as Christians, we wait for the society and the government to wake up when really God's waiting for us to wake up. We're disappointed in other, other people in places not doing their job, and I wonder if God's disappointed sometimes in us because we're not doing our job. Amen? But God loves us. Aren't you glad that God has grace and mercy for us? He's got a plan for us. God says, those that love me, what? We'll do what? We'll have a, he has a good plan for those that love him. I love him. I know he's got a good plan for my life. He's got a good plan for your guys' life. Well, I want you to let you know that this, uh, this message today is a hope-filled, solution-based message. It's a hope-filled, solution-based message. So if you're taking notes, just when Holy Spirit speaks to you, write it down wherever you are. So how does a church find its identity? Because I think we have a little identity crisis right now. Well, we find it back in the Word of God. From the very beginning, we look at the very beginning in Genesis, Adam and Eve, right? God said, Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply and then take dominion over the earth. Well, what does dominion mean? Because that stands for us too. Dominion is this, when you are in charge of something or you rule it. You see, God calls Christians to be the heads and not the tail. We say that in our children's ministry. Boys and girls, you're the head and not the tail. Sometimes we forget, we get to wag and we forget who we are. We have a little bit of identity crisis right now. We're just, God's about to wake us back up, amen? So Jesus mentions the church in four different ways. Look at Matthew 11 if you, you like to follow along in your Bible or you can follow along on the screen. It says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Raise your hand if you like the military because that's a military scripture. I like the military. I support the military. This is a military scripture right here. God tells the church to go on the military offense. In defense, what you're trying to do is you're trying to stop the person from scoring. Sometimes we can get defensive mode. We're getting pushed back by the enemy. God is telling us right now as Christians, it's time to get on the offense. You start taking back what's been taken from you, right? You start going forward. And sometimes when we just put our foot down in the sand and we dig in and say, God, you're bigger than anything. Watch what happens. We'll start to take back things. But here's a little secret, a little secret. We're at war with the devil, whether we realize it or not. I heard one time a pastor say that 70% of the people, Christians, don't believe that we have a, an enemy even though God clearly says that you have an enemy that wants to steal, kill, and destroy from you. All right? One example, I want to talk about this. When, when the church wars, we win, according to Scripture. When you look back in history, when the church stands up to be the church, we win. When we don't, we begin to lose. Right? One example of a battle the church lost is the church shrunk back. It didn't use its voice. In 1962, it allowed for the church to be removed from the public school. And I'm an educator. But when we fight biblically, we always win. That's our identity. You, do you know that your identity as a Christian is a winner? That's our identity, amen? God tells us we have a real enemy that wants to steal from us, and he's been doing a lot of stealing lately. Think about it. He's been doing a lot of stealing, and we have to take it back. You know that the enemy will only give back to you what, what he's stolen if you take it by force. So if you ask nicely or you ask please from the devil, he's not going to give back what he's taken. He loves nice Christians. Right? He can defeat a nice Christian. He can't defeat a Christian that leans on the word of God and uses the word of God like the sword that it is to, to destroy him. Right? He'll only give back your mind, your health, your families, your communities when you take it by force. The good news when the church goes on the offense, like I said, we win. That's step one to the church awakening. It is time to go on the offense. No more reeling and just responding. We're just moving forward and taking back in prayer what God calls us to do. All right, here's, check it out. Here's the first mention of the church in the New Testament. This is Jesus, Matthew 16, verse 18. Check out the context. It's, it's serious business right here. Look at verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Jesus says, you're my church, talking to us, and the gates of hell should not prevail. Do you know the, the, the Greek word for gate, right, for gate means prule. And prule means a gate that's designed to keep somebody shut in. Are you hearing what the scripture says? God says, I'm giving you the church, the keys to unlock those gates that the, that the enemy set up in your towns, your communities, your states, your country. I'm telling you, he has certain gates that he sets up in certain areas. You all know this. You can drive through Enid and there's a feeling, if, you're, if, you're, if, if you are a sensor like I do, I, I feel what's going on in that community. If I go through Watonga, I can feel a sense of what the devil's done there. 
He's capitalized even Watonga through the prison, a, a sense of depression. There's a gated depression in the town of Watonga. We got our gates too, so don't get too crazy. We got our gates. And sometimes as Christians, we walk around those gates until I got other things, I'm busy. And we let those gates stay there. Even though I know there's some of my friends behind that, trapped in that little prison right there that need my help, and God sent me to, to free them. He's given me the key, giving you the key, the key to unlock those gates. Hope you're receiving this. A stronghold or gate is a stationary object to keep people in. When Jesus talks about strongholds of the devil, he's talking about the devil's influence in a particular area. Here's an example. There's a stronghold of poverty. If you don't think poverty is a stronghold, it's because you've never, probably never been poor. The devil wants you gated in that stronghold, right? There are certain people gated in uh, poverty and there are certain communities. Addiction is a stronghold of the devil. Chronic sickness is a stronghold of the devil. Deception in a community is a stronghold of the devil. Corruption, idolatry, perversion, divorce, abortion, those are all strongholds. Yet we got all the keys to break those down as Christians. Jesus is saying here, not one of Satan's strongholds, not one of the gates he puts up in the community can withstand a Christian that begins to use the keys that God's authorized us to use. Amen? Aren't you glad that Jesus has authorized us to have victory over those things? Amen? When you decide to war against the devil, identify the stronghold and war against it. How do you war? Through prayer. I'm going to talk about some other ways. Through prayer is one of the powerful ways that God's given you to war. So that, here's the good news. You could be right now watching from the hospital, lying in bed, and doing more unlocking of gates than someone that's 25 years old in perfect health. Because it's not a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. We are a gate-taking, evasive force. I believe the church in general has lost its identity. I'll say it again. We're a gate-taking, invasive force, if you're taking notes. Precious people are hurting, and they're in bondage, and we're the ones with the spiritual authority to unlock it and get them out and rescue them, even though they don't know they need it, right? Right? But sometimes we can be a little more focused on the next activity in our life, the next event, the next sporting event. We're more focused on, on things than we are of releasing people out of the gates they're in. I'm guilty of that. You ever been guilty? God's given me the authority to do it, yet sometimes i got the keys hanging from my hip and I'm not using them. I hope you're hearing this. Okay? But the church is the answer. God never mentions government. Read scripture. You see government listed in there, right? He says pray for the government, but the government's not the answer. See, the devil loves, here's what the devil loves. He loves when Christians expect a government to save them. Why? Because the devil knows the government doesn't have spiritual authority to stop him. Only the church does. We have the authority to stop him. The government does not. Yet we put so much emphasis sometimes what the government is or not doing, so much emphasis on the local, local leadership, so much emphasis on school systems to do what the church is supposed to do. When the church is a church, we win everywhere. When the church is a church. There's a gate set up right now against our elderly in our community and probably a lot of communities across the country. It's a gate of isolation and loneliness. That gate has a purpose. That purpose is to get them so depressed they want to give up. Yet we need the elderly for their wisdom to help the younger generation. So what can the church do? What can the church do? What can it do, Pastor? Well, people from Lifeway, we've been going to the elderly community in Kingfisher. We've been feeding them, praying with them, taking them needed items, taking the church to them and letting them know, hey, the church still sees you. Right? We're warring against the gate of loneliness and despair. Right? Those gates are coming down. And listen, we're seeing hope restored in these elderly people. A gate's being unlocked and hope, hope is being restored. That's what the church was designed to do. I know the way the church was being the church. When a person in our church, we, we had an idea. From Katie had this idea. We have, a, we have an individual in our church that owns a company that makes a special material that wraps around pipes so the pipes don't freeze right, in the winter, and they also don't overheat in the summer. The idea was brought to this owner of the company and says, hey, listen, can we get your extra material so we can meet a need in Oklahoma City? Do you know in Oklahoma City we have a lot of homeless people? Do, does God still love the homeless? Yes, sir. Right? Do you know a homeless person froze to death in Tulsa? Where was the church? So check it out. So we go to this, comp this owner of the company and says, will you give us your X materials? And he says, I'll do better than that. Give me a little time. He, and two weeks later, he calls us and he says, check out what I had my company make. 
and he made these sleeping mats with straps and everything they can take with them. This, this material is designed, listen, designed to keep the cold off their body. It's a high-tech material. It's not a regular material. They can put it on the ground. That literally can save a life of a homeless person. What just happened? We took the gate of forgottenness. That God, nobody remembers us. We took that gate down and reminded him that Jesus loves you. That's just a church being the church. That's a church unlocking a gate that seemed lockable. That was unlockable, but that's just a church being the church. Jesus says the gates of hell cannot withstand you. You got keys. All of us have different keys. Pat has different keys than Terry has. You all got different keys. God's given us certain gifts to use to unlock doors. Amen. Here's what we can all do. We all can read the word and we all can pray. But Jesus says the gates of hell cannot withstand you. Satan builds different gates in every community. Here's what happens. He looks at a community and he says, he tries to find a common thread that they all struggle with. And he says to himself sometimes, I can get that community over there with, with poverty. And he sets a gate of poverty in there, hoping they stay trapped in it, right? And then he looks at another community like Kingfisher and says, I can get that community not maybe with poverty, but I can give it with pride. Sometimes Kingfisher thinks it's better than surrounding towns. That stung a little because that's the truth. Been here since 2000. I've been prideful. I used to brag about my test scores when I was a principal that we were ranked number one in the whole state. I used to brag all the time. Instead of thinking, God, I'm bragging about it, that's pride. We have a spirit of pride that has been, thra it's a spirit that's been thrashing our community. What does pride do? It makes you overlook things that aren't right. I'm not going to say nothing because as long as we're number one in sports, school systems, or whatever it might be, I'll overlook things that are being done wrong. Yet God says, unlock it, it's pride. But people don't want to talk about it because you may not be their friend. I'm past being people's friends. I want to be what Jesus has called me to be. Yeah. Amen. At some point, you've got to be the Christian God's called you to be. And that's not me. I love people. I hate Satan. Amen. I love people. I hate Satan. But Jesus is more powerful than pride. Jesus is more powerful than sickness. Jesus is more powerful than deception, the spirit of deception that deceives people. Jesus is more powerful than all those things, but he's given us all authority to be the church. Here's Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everybody say hope of glory. If you're a believer, the hope of glory is inside you. God's waiting for you to release the hope of glory to other people. You have the hope that a hurting world needs. It's in you. Well, Jesus, you do it. Why would Jesus do something he's told us to do? He's told us to release the hope which is in him. Let people know about your testimony. Share the word of God when they're depressed. Open up the word of God because it has the power. Not you. Not your fancy words because I tried fancy words and it doesn't do nothing. Right? I thought I was pretty poetic with myself. The word of God, when you begin to read it out loud and encourage, there's a scripture for every battle that someone's going through. Share the word. How many of you love, how many of you love the word of God? If you're a Christian, I hope. Um, there's some Christians that just read the verse of the day. You know, if Tanya made this beautiful chocolate cake for me, uh, I'd be surprised because she doesn't like to bake, but I'd be shocked. She cooks but doesn't bake. I'm the baker, Terry, Terry Crocker. My friends call me Terry Crocker. Do you know that? You're a pastor. I'd be cooking from scratch, for real. Anyways, if Tanya made this beautiful chocolate cake for me, and I took, I took a bite, and then she walks by, and she says, do you love it? And I said, I love it. And the, an hour later, there's still only a bite taken from the piece of cake. Do I really love it? If I'm reading the Word of God, am I, do I really love the Word of God? I'm taking a bite of Scripture? Moving on. We have the hope of glory that's in us, and lost people need to hear about the hope of glory. Listen, do you know that churches weren't designed for spaghetti dinners? I try to find that in the scripture. Spaghetti dinners, spaghetti dinners. They're for equipping the saints. My job as pastor is to equip you as a saint to go do the work for the kingdom, right? Right? I got a pastor friend. Listen, I feel bad for this pastor because his church doesn't get it. He gets it. The church he's at doesn't get it. They expect him to go to every hospital, every funeral, to go to everything, every, go to people's house. He, he is designed to preach but do it all. That's not scripture. Scripture says I'm supposed to equip the saints to go do the work of the ministry. 
right? And I'm glad I don't have people. I, I'm glad I turn the corner and people have ideas like this. Matt, I don't got to come up with ideas because God has equipped you and you're coming up with ideas. It's awesome, right? It's good. You may say, well, pastor, your, your preaching is just a little aggressive right now. Well, I, listen, I know it is. I'm not upset. My heart's broken because there's people in this town that I personally know that are hurting and lost and they're not getting reached. And maybe I can't say the right thing to trigger that, but you have a key. That's right. And they'll listen to you more sometimes. They'll look, I'm a, you're a pastor. You, you got, everything's perfect in your life. They don't know that. That's not true anyways. But you can reach them. Maybe I can't. Okay? I would say look around all these empty seats in the, in the church. We have a lot of empty seats. Would you pray and believe that this time next year that every seat, would you join me in prayer for the next year? Because that's my prayer. God, fill every seat with someone that's hurting and lost that needs to hear the gospel, that needs to feel the love of Jesus, right? They want what you have. They just don't know it. So I just want you to join in prayer that, God, every seat would be filled, right? Look at, uh, I'm going to read Matthew 28, but I say sometimes people say, well, Pastor Terry, I just want to be a regular Christian. I want you to just be a normal Christian, right? Look at Matthew 28. Here's a normal Christian. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That's, that's a call. That's a commission for the normal Christian. It doesn't say pastor baptized. You know, you have authority to spiritually to baptize somebody. Yeah. You can lead them to Jesus and baptize them right then. Boom. It's awesome. And it's fun baptizing people. Unless you accidentally let go of them. I let go of Jack one time. He goes, don't drop me, Terry. Well, I bapt- he moved in the water and I dropped him. It, it was so funny. His feet stick straight up in the air and I felt so bad. I, I've only dropped one person. It's Jack Kleckner. He's here somewhere. and I think he's out in the lobby. I felt so bad a little bit. But I'm telling you, you have authority to baptize people. God's called you and commissioned you to be disciple. Well, what's a disciple? Think about this. A disciple is this. That means when you agree to walk alongside somebody, maybe a baby Christian or someone that's hurting, you're walking alongside them, encouraging them, sharing scripture, meeting with them weekly or whatever that looks like, and then pretty soon they get strong, and then you can go to somebody else, and then they're doing it to somebody else. We're making disciples. That's what disciples look like. See, you're not, it's not good enough just to share Jesus and lead someone to Christ. God says, that's good, but be a disciple. Walk alongside them until they can, their foundation is strong. Okay? When the church is a gate-taking aggressive force, Jesus says that we win. People get saved and set free from bondages. Right? And God gets all the glory. When we don't, when we don't do what God has commissioned us to do, what happens in our communities happen. What happens in America happens. Right? And we become like churches in Europe. Do you know churches in Europe are fossils right now? They're fossils. They're just pretty buildings with no one showing up. They become fossil. They've lost the power. They're a fossil. I don't want to be a fossil. God's commissioned to, I don't believe we're fossil. God didn't say build this building to be a fossil. But he's also told us to do an assignment as a church. And if we'll do what he's told us to do, this place will fill up. I just promise you. Okay? I think here's the deal. We got to want the lost more than the devil wants them because whoever wants them most gets them. When's the last time you found yourself praying for someone that's hurting, praying for somebody that knows that needs the Lord? Okay, I want to encourage you that. See, the birthright of the church is victory. Jesus said the gates of hell themselves cannot withstand a warring church, a warring church. Now, here's the first mission. Jesus sends out regular Christians to do a really big assignment. And they do all this stuff, and they're out there, regular Christians, 70 of them. We hear about the disciples, but here's 70 regular Christians. And they come back, and here's what they tell Jesus. Listen, this is in Luke chapter 10. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan, Jesus says this, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. That's how fast Satan got kicked out of heaven, like lightning, right? Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions, that's demonic things, right? And over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Aren't you thankful your name's written? Can we thank Jesus for our names being written in heaven? That's just good stuff. That's good news for us. Good news. So Jesus sends out these regular believers to share the gospel and to set people free. The disciples, I wonder if the disciples are standing there and they're watching this. When the 70 get back and they start talking to each other, I thought we had the power. They got power too. 
right? And they start to wonder, I thought we could only do those things. Yet God has commissioned regular believers to do great things. That means when the church is being the church and people are getting saved and set free, it limits the devil's angle on things. Now the devil's only going to yield to force. When the devil's trying to, trying to take something from you, or maybe he's taking something from you already, right? Like one of your kids, or maybe your health, or maybe your community, right? Or maybe your peace, you have to be forceful with the devil. He's not going to lay down and say, sorry, you caught me, you found me, right? You got to be forceful, and you got to believe, and you got to have bold faith, and you got to believe the scripture that you're praying over the situation. You got to be forceful. Jesus is saying, any battle you're in with the devil, if you fight Jesus' way, that you win. 100% chance of guarantee winning, right? A war prayer sounds like this. I bind up the spirit of pride in our community. I bind up that spirit. No longer has influence in this community of Kingfisher. Whatever your community has, I bind that up and I release healing and humbleness, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. amen. I'm just exercising real, uh, real spiritual authority in that moment. Amen. So many believers are losing and churches are losing because they're coasting and not fighting. The devil loves coasting Christians because he'll coast right in and steal you blind. He loves coasting Christians. How cruel would it be for God to put us in a battle and not equip us with the authority not to win, right? That's like a coach not telling the kid to play. Go out there and win the game. Uh, poor little guy don't got a chance. God ain't like that. He's equipped us to win the battle. In Luke 14, there's a large group following Jesus. Now, when Jesus refers to family right here, the reason he's referring to family is because he's comparing. Listen, you can't even love family. I can't even love Tanya more than I love Jesus. God says, I'll have nothing in front of me. Anything you put in front of God, even good things like kids and family, that's an idol. So you can, this is compared to that. Listen, here's Luke 14, verse 25. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must... By comparison, hate everyone else, your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. If you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. But don't begin until you count the cost. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? All right, so there's this multitude, multi, multitude of people following Jesus, right? They're all following. They're amazed by his miracles, and they're saying, he is the nicest guy. Jesus is so cool. He's so nice, right? <laughs> and Jesus, I think it's right there. I'm going to summarize. He says, I better tell him what the program's really about. And he stops and he turns around. And he says, listen, you better count the cost because if you're going to follow me, fully devoted following me, it's going to cost you. Yeah. Well, Jesus, what's it going to cost us? It's going to cost you family, friends, promotions. Yeah. Yeah. Are you counting the cost? It's going to cost you. If you want to take back territory, if you're going to take a stand for biblical values and not world values, it's going to cost you. Guess who doesn't get invited to the meetings anymore? Guess who doesn't get to go to the potluck sometimes? Because you took a stand for the word of God. When you take a biblical stand for what is right, you may lose some friends. You've got to count the cost. I'm saying to you, we're nice to people, but we hate the devil. The devil is placing certain gates up in cities all over the country. He's having a heyday right now. Why? Because the church isn't stopping him. I said the government can't stop him. The church has the only spiritual authority to stop him. It's the church's responsibility to declare war on those gates. When we do that, Jesus promises, right, us to win. Those gates come down. The culture changes. And when we don't, what happens in America right now happens. The local church is the hope of the world. I'm going to say it. The local church, guys, is the hope of the world. It is. There is no other hope. It's the hope of the world. Hope of the world. Here's four quick things as I close up on successful victory in warfare. If you're taking notes, here we go. Number one, hatred for the enemy. Hatred for the enemy. You, do you know that there's one person that God allows us to hate? Right? And that's the devil. Frankly, I don't think Christians hate the devil enough. I think we put up with him sometimes. I don't want to mess with you right now. And we don't take spiritual authority. We don't hate them enough. If someone mess with your kid right in front of you, you're going to stop that, right? Well, they're messing with our kids right now, the next generation. We got to hate the devil. God tells us to. Look at, look at the scripture, 1 John 3, 8. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy, that's a hard word, destroy the works of the devil. And look at Proverbs 8. 
To fear the Lord is to hate evil. God's given you permission to hate anything that the devil does. He wants you to hate him, not just put up with him. Jesus hates the devil. Why? Because he knows the devil hurts you. Remember, Jesus knit you together. He made only one you. So when someone messes with one of his kids, he has a problem with that. The evil that's happening in the world right now is not a person's fault. It's the devil's fault. The devil loves when we get mad at a person. Instead of, instead of spiritually praying for that person and, and unlocking that gate that's messing with that person, the devil wants you folks on the person. It's not a person. It's demonic. It's a spirit behind the person that caused him to do stupid stuff. It's just what it is. You may ask when the devil's going to stop hurting our country. Well, listen, he's never going to stop until he gets where he's going. And he knows where he's going. He just wants to take as many people with him as possible. Why? Because he hates Jesus so much, he hates anything that Jesus made. I'm not ashamed of the Bible. I hope you're not ashamed. I'm not ashamed of the Holy Spirit. We sing the Holy Spirit. He's God too. I'm not ashamed of anything that the Bible represents. I've gotten past what people think about me, and I only care what Jesus thinks about me. I had to get to that point. Tanya knows this. We've talked about this. Because all of us, I think, have a tendency to want to be liked, right? But at some point, you got to care, care, care more about what Jesus says. And the hurting and lost, and you care about your own self. You've, we've got to get to that point. And then we've got to focus on how do we war, Lord? How do we war in this area that's affecting my kids, affecting my community? We start praying, and we start warring, and we start binding up and unlocking things spiritually. It's all spiritual. It's not physical. It's spiritual. And you can start praying. Listen, this is a biblical. God either changed their heart or removed them out of our community. I've made that prayer. Either change their heart, got them to repent, or remove them out of this community. This is your community. When I tell other pastors I live in Kingfisher, they go, what a great name. Kingfisher, that's almost like a biblical name. Fishers of men. People should think of Kingfisher, and that is an amazing place where Jesus has dominion because churches have exercised authority and taken this area back. Amen? All right. Number two, comparison for people that are, uh, compassion for people that are lost and hurting. See, we need to see people for how precious they are in God's sight. I'm not talking about people that think they're good. I'm talking about bad people. <laughs> it's easy for me to love Jimmy because I know Jimmy's a believer and a good person. Uh, Jesus is talking about bad people. Do you have compassion and love for bad people? Well, you're praying for them. I'm talking about this group, real group, that organized a movement last week. Check this out. This is real. I'll show you a picture, but it's not appropriate. A movement was put together last week of giving Christianity the bird. And they showed a bunch of young people flipping off God. October, uh, August 12th, they all gathered together across the country, and they all took shot, a picture shot at the same time, and they put it online, and it's spreading. How do I war against those? I pray for them. That they get convicted and come to know Jesus that loves them. They put that finger down and point to him. That's how I wore for them. I'm not mad at him. They're deceived. I was deceived for a long time until someone prayed for me. I was a bad person. But someone prayed for me, my nana. I met Jesus in seventh grade because a pastor shared Jesus with me. And I was convicted and I surrendered. So how can I get mad at a group of people that just don't get it because I used to not get it. So I pray for them. Over half the people in every community right now are lost. They're hurting and they're lost and they're deceived. And we have an opportunity with all the keys to lead them to Jesus and unlock the gates that they're trapped in. Amen? We have to see the devil for who he is. We have to hate him and we also have to see the lost for how God sees them. And we have to love them. Number three, work together. Jesus sent the disciples out together. The more severe things became, the more they needed each other. Amen? You know scripture. He sent them out in pairs often and groups often, right? We need each other. We make up the church. God says you are part of the body. Do you know that? Not everybody can be an eye. Not everybody can be a pastor. Not everybody can be a foot. But when you decide to miss church, gathering together, God says don't forsake the assembly. It's almost like Iron Man when all his equipment comes on him. When you don't stand in the, when you don't show up to church and you just stay on, there's a place for online if you're watching, there's a place. But if you're home right now and you should be at church, I want to, I want to say you're missing to be part of the body. The body needs you. We have to stay together. We have to, we have to show together. God says iron sharpens iron. When you're around somebody, you're sharpening them. You have certain things. I don't got nothing, Pastor. Yes, you do. God's giving you gifts. 
and you're sharpening other people. We miss you when you're gone. And the last thing is this, willingness to pay the price for victory. Jesus says, before you go to war, you better count the cost or you're going to get in the war and you're going to get messed up. What's it going to cost you? It's going to cost you time. It's going to cost you time reading the Word of God and and turning off your favorite TV show but getting in the Word of God. It's going to cost you commitment to praying. It's going to cost you surrendering your own desires but picking up the cross daily. God talks about that. It's going to cost you finances because God's going to have you give to the church so when he sends people to the church, right, they can meet him. It's going to cost you finances. It's going to cost you time serving so when God sends someone to the church that you can open the door and you can love on them so the first pe- person they see is not you, they see Jesus because they feel loved on. You know, more people, they'll come within two minutes, they decide if they're going to stay in a church or not if they feel loved before they even hear how good preaching is or how bad preaching is. Two minutes, that's the research. So what do you do? You're out there loving on people. You're serving in your church. You're, if you're a part of this church, you should be serving somewhere. Somewhere. We have plenty of places to serve. You're a part of the body. It's going to cost us, but I want to say it's all worth it. Is it not worth it? We're on, listen, we're on the winning team, and it's worth it. Let's give God a cut praise because we're on the winning team. It's going to cost us, but we're on the winning team. We're on the winning team. Go ahead and bow your heads as, as I close in prayer. I say this is a critical time in our nation's history. The devil is counting on the church to be a bunch of lukewarm Christians, but that's not who Lifeway is. That's not who you are. If you're not on fire for God, not totally committed to God, I'm asking you right now to change that and to say, God, I'm all in. I'm counting the cost, Lord. Whatever sin I have to lose, whatever friend I have to lose, I'm going to be a believer that stands up for you and makes a difference. I'll no longer get caught up in the world, but I'll be committed to being the light of the world. I'd say here, if that's you today and you're ready to step up in the battlefield and be who God's called you to be, would you just stand? I'm, I'm doing a call out. If that's you and you're God, I'm all in. I'm standing up for you. If that's you and you say, I'm all in, I'm even stepping up my game spiritually to be in this battle that you're called us to be in. I want to be even hotter than you've called. I'm just going to pray over us right now, everybody. Father, I just pray every single person standing right now that you would give them more opportunities to have influence in the, in the area of influence that they live in. Lord, and I just bind up the enemy in the name of Jesus, and I release, Father, your healing power over every community that we represent. Lord, I pray that you would give us great boldness to do all things in love, but that means all things. And if I see a gate closed, I pray, Lord, that every single person will start to use the keys that you've given them, given them to use. Fill every believer standing with supernatural power to do what you've called them to do. Right now, please, Holy Spirit, fill us up with power. Power, Lord, fall on us. Fall on us. If you're here and you don't know Jesus Christ and you want to get saved, just slip your hand up and say, yes, Pastor, I want Jesus in my heart right now. I've never done that. I want him right now in my heart. I've never done that. Anyone today? prayer team come on up hey right where you are we're standing we're just in the state father lord continue to move holy spirit this is this is your church move right now as we worship you the last song i pray that you would continue to just fill us up to the brim with your presence that we leave here just leaking out the presence and power of god whoever we touch and pray for gets healed whoever we touch and pray for gets healed so let's lift our voices as we close worship team lead us in worship prayer team come on up